just when you thought it was safe to go onto iTunes. This is Next Level Guy. The only website that makes self-development as fun as going to the movies. It's time to take the red pill and escape the Matrix. What's happening, guys? It's time for another episode of the Next Level Guy Show podcast with your favourite tutor, Ian Dawson McKay. Next Level Guy is a go-to mains, interview, interest and improvement website where I quiz the experts to find out the hacks, tips, methods and protocols that you can implement in your own life to take it to the next level and live happier, wealthier, sexier and so much more. Today's guest is Rianne Stone. He's a red pill dating speaker, author and content creator. He provides insight into men's psychological hang-ups that sabotages a fulfilling sex life, along with the social problems that come along with everything else. In this interview, we discuss how to attract women, how to fix our internal demons, and how to build a life that attracts others, but most importantly, one that we love ourselves. Now let's get to the interview. You know, we've just discussed there that you, you're brought up in Canada and stuff like that, and it's, you know, I am from the Highland Scotland. It's not normal really to get into kind of dating, you know, like pick up and all that kind of stuff and the red pill society, that sort of thing. How did you get into it? You know, like, can you tell me a little bit about your upbringing? From Edmonton. And then my mom got divorced to my dad. He was kind of a, a playboy. He was the leisure suit seventies kind of guy. Eventually the gambling was a little bit too much. And so she moved to small town, British Columbia and well to do family. We had like a logging camp and a ranch. I think a cement plant too. I'm probably forgetting something, but whatever. Uh, pretty rough upbringing. He was the kind of stepfather that's like, you're not a man until you fight your old man. And then at that point, I rebelled against the family by going to college. Did that for a while. And I kind of had that same aimlessness that guys are having. And I switched over, got bored one day when I was drunk and joined the military. As you do. <laughs> yeah, as one often does. And then... So I did 12 years there and I kind of have, I call this the Batman origin story. It's the thing that kind of red pilled me was. So the whole idea is I like the idea of queen and country. That was awesome. It was like a mission to latch onto, gave me some meaning. And then over 12 years, I basically like all Canadian top my classes, super performer, all that kind of stuff. And I kind of started to see signs, but didn't really notice them like getting passed over promotions for, cause they wanted more women in there and that kind of thing. And then at one point, my unit tried weaponizing a charge against me, put me under like a 12 month investigation. I don't know if you followed the Canadian forces news at all, but there's one about uh, a case that Trudeau just basically put our second in command of the Navy under investigation for leaking secrets to industry and that kind of thing. Pretty much a similar experience to his was mine. And that kind of disenchanted me with the whole thing. So I always joke that I never really got red pilled around women because I've always been kind of like you did. I was doing pickup back in the day, the mystery days. I think that was even before RSD. God, uh, the, so, with the game and that. Yeah, I remember the, that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the DVDs there. I liked it because I had a busy work schedule. I was sailing 180 days a year, two weeks at a time. So you can't really have a date. And then it's like, yeah, I'll see you again in three weeks. It doesn't really fly. But uh so then at least with game, what happened is I could make it into an event and I could work on weak spots and it actually made it more fun as opposed to before, which was mostly just frustrating. So and then the women thing, like I never really had the option even to settle down. I ever never had that need. And usually when girls got too crazy, I would just eventually just and I should probably thank my stepdad for this because Carl from Black Label Logic, he says usually from these kind of more traumatic childhoods, you get what's called blunted effect where eventually you just kind of switch off and walk away. So so where did this come? Like, was that the, the attraction to, like, the pick up and the red pill? Was it, like, meeting different people and wanting to make that quick connection and, you know, kind of, like, move things along, if, um, you know, try to keep it cl- relatively clean to begin with? But, you know, it was that, you know, where you just look at where you're, where you're just looking for, a, like, a jump and then go off somewhere else? Or, you know, we was there a kind of like a something that happened that made you get into like, you know, I need to get my social, my social skills. I need to get like group dynamics worked on and that sort of thing. Oh yeah. See that stuff. That was all fine. Like I was pretty decently charismatic guy. I know how to talk to people in that. Anyway, the pickup part was literally because I had no time to myself. I, 
if I didn't have sex with a girl on like the first date, it wouldn't have happened. And there's been a lot of times where even after I kind of learned what I was doing, I basically had to stop having sex to quickly run to work because we had to sail that morning. So it really was, I just needed a way to make the small amount of time that I had work for me because the alternative was just to be basically a hardworking incel, I guess, before it was a term. And I almost went big towel. So that was the kind of thing I want to thank Mystery and Neil Strauss for is that they actually made, even when I was failing in dating, at least then I was failing forward. So it made it fun again. And then as far as red pill stuff, that was mostly pure desperation. Cause when something I found out and I haven't really known, cause I've only ever had one long-term relationship, long string of girls, serial monogamist, whatever, a lot of one night stands, a lot of plates, a lot of friends with benefits. Uh, the one I'm with now, she just never gave me a reason to bounce her. Like every other girl would have a glaring defect. So it's not so much that I settled down. It's just that I didn't, she didn't give me a reason to kick her out. And it's been like 10, 11 years. <laughs> I hope she's not standing beside you right now. No, she's coming home. She's bringing a <laughs> bottle of wine later. So it's all good. Um, we're one of those, we're one of those couples. I've, she, she knows about all this stuff. She watches the shows and that. So I got nothing to hide that way. But uh, the funny thing, the reason I was getting to this was when you're down, I didn't really know this, but women kind of, they start looking at other options and start getting increasingly frustrated, increasingly ornery. So when I was down, she proceeded to, you know, put her boot on my neck. And that was kind of what got me there because I just eventually found the married red pill. I don't remember how I even got there, but it's the same thing as every guy does. He's like, oh, all of a sudden, all this crap that I have no idea what's going on and I can't parse it. People have like put it into a roadmap here. They're like, yeah, this is what happened. These are the reasons why it most likely happened. And here's what you do to get out of it. So I just had one quick, uh, oh yeah, you want to keep this PG. No, no, go for it. It's, uh, I'd, rather you, I'd rather you be honest and swear because I'll be letting rep, don't worry. Fair enough. Hate fuck in the shower. I basically Operation Scorched Earth and took it from there. I was pretty much ready to nuke my entire life and start again. And then as I went through going through all the steps of dread and that I gave every person and organization, like everything around me, the opportunity to show me that it was valuable in my life. And they had until I had my act together to do it. And so she st- she did. And so she stuck around the military didn't. So they're gone. Couple, f- most of my friends are still around. There's a few that I kind of had to leave on that one, but I mean, that's pretty much it. Same as you said is I had a problem. It was an awesome solution. And so I stuck with it. And how did you go about analyzing the situation? You know, like, how did you look at what was to go and what was not? Was it just the vibe it gave you? Did you kind of just look at pros and cons, you know, or did you just think, no, nah, just uh, I'm not getting what I need from it. I'm off. You know, did you, was there any kind of like way of doing it or was it just how you felt at the time? See, that's just it. It's not, I didn't feel anything. And that's the weirdest thing. And that's why I brought up that blunted effect before. I mean, I just went cold. Because I mean, you have to understand too. So for the last, and I hate, I'm going to try and keep this quick because I hate this Batman origin story testicular cancer crap. I'll get into that later if you really want to. But over the past year, I was put under an investigation, but I didn't know why. I didn't know what it was for. And I didn't know what the result was going to be. And all I had was, it was like a Damocles sword thing. And so that caused huge panic attacks, basically. It's the same as anything. If all of a sudden you're thrown in jail and you don't know why, and you know after about six months of asking questions and not getting any answers, it kind of starts to build some uh, anxiety in you. And so the one thing I did is I finally said, you know what? Fuck this. What do I want out of this? And at that point, I'm just like, I want to beat this thing. So I just shut off, hit the gym extra hard again because they had put the military just put me on SSRIs, which is a horrible thing. I can't believe they give kids that stuff. I don't know if you've ever had anybody who's been on like Ritalin or Ativan or anything like that, but. No, it's a real personal experience. I've, I've heard about some of the serious side effects. Yeah. Oh, the sexual side effects too. But um, so eventually I just cut everything. I'm like, you know what? Screw all this. Everybody seems to know what's best for me and it's not working. So I'm just going to do it myself. And then I did. And like I said, didn't have any feelings whatsoever. It was to me, it was like strictly looking at an instruction manual. And then I started reading through probably a thousand different guys field reports who had plenty of situations. Some were better. Some were worse than mine. Got into all the books. I read all of Rolo. I read all of Ironwood, Athel K, even Roosh. Uh, some of the reports from the guys that worked with me, like Bogey D6, UEM McGill, Scorcher Zang, a bunch of the moderators there. It's just like a million words. I shit you not. 
And then all it was is I saw what the mental models and deep narratives that guys were switching to. Very self-interested, none of this plow horse mentality. If you don't know what that is, that's where you want to light yourself on fire to keep other war- other people warm, like a very selfless way of acting, which usually ends up kicking you in the ass and mm. kind of was the one that got me the hard way. And then you have to understand that as a man, your value is what you can provide to others. So you don't just get intrinsically get respect because of your, who you are. That's something that women get. And so then it was all just like a little bunch of little mental models. And then you put them all together. You come up with what you want out of this. And then you just move forward. And it's great. It kind of gives you a nice it gives you a nice direction to all your energy, I guess would be the best way of putting it. So like, say, yeah. Does that make sense? It was a bit rambly. No, it, it, it makes perfect sense. I mean, I think that's the biggest issue with a lot of guys. I mean, myself when I was younger was you wait for somebody to tell you. You know, we come through school with people telling you where to sit, where to eat, when to go for a piss. Then you go and get a job and they tell you what to do and that. And there's so many people I know that can't make a decision. They can't just act on their own. You know, they can't judge a situation and decide what they're going to do because it's almost like we've lost that art, you know, to lead and to be the guy that takes charge. And, you know, would you say that's what's wrong with modern day guys that we've just... <laughs> That's an ex. We've just become bands of question you yeah. just asked. <laughs> but, well, that's that's what bugs me. It's like the number of times I speak to people and they're just like, "Oh no, yeah, I won't be able to do that." And it's like, "Well, you've just said that's what you need to fix. Why not just go do it?" Oh yeah, you know, I'll have to look into it. And then you know they go and ask somebody else, and they need to get told no, rather than try it themselves, try it, get that experience points, and then think, "No, that's not for me." Or yes, that job's for me. Yeah, fear of failure, hundred percent. I'd say there's a bunch of different problems. So, like, depending on the level of resolution you want to get at, you can look at it as a societal problem. And I wrote about this one in, in my blog where men used to have a life script because it was issued to them. So we had to go fight in World War II. Like it was pretty much a war every generation until until like Generation X. So every guy automatically had to be a man because he had to go, they needed it. They needed strong backs or before that they needed guys to work on the farm. Like there was always something that was required of you. And so you had to grow up. So we don't really have that anymore. So there's that part of it. So nobody tells you to be a man. Like you said, nobody gave you permission because they need you for whatever. Add to that. There's this weird phenomenon that they can't figure out what's happening. It's that there's a drop in testosterone across all generations of men. So, for example, a 20-year-old man born in 2000 has the same testosterone of like a 60-year-old man that was born in 1980. And they can't explain it. It's just something that's constantly going down. And the problem with that is testosterone is a, has a couple effects on the body. Two of them is you tend to have muted empathy, so you tend not to cry on movies or you know, automatically feel bad if you have to, you know, kill your dog because he got rabbit or something like that. Or, And then the other effect on that is it tends to make you act more effeminate, be less sexually attractive. So it's essentially like reducing masculinity from a chemical level, mm-hmm. which wouldn't be so bad except for, I don't know if you've ever tried to get blood work done, but in Canada where I'm from, I actually had to argue with my doctor for 20 minutes because as soon as I mentioned, I want to get some blood work, I'm in my 30s and I want to have a baseline. So when I get older, I know if I'm dropping too fast or something. And it was 20 minutes of arguing. Apparently, I was going to get back acne, lose my hair. My testicles were going to fall off. And I was going to start punching women in the street if I even went and get a blood test. It was like the most ridiculous thing. And then they didn't even know how to do the blood test. So when I got the numbers back, they didn't make any sense. So I had to go and get like a private test done. It worked out well, thank God. But. Imagine if you're just a guy who doesn't even know to check for this stuff, though. And all you know is that you can't sleep and you're always very emotional. You don't even doctor wouldn't even think to test you for this stuff. So you take that, you take the lack of need for you in society, and then you take and it's not even a bad thing. I call it supermarket masculinity. You know how like being the provider, you bring home the bacon and that's what makes you a man. Mm -hmm. So the problem now is that women are making money and they're making a lot of money. They're. I think it's, these are American stats and I'm probably misquoting them, but 40% or something like that of, uh, of households, the female is the primary breadwinner. 
So that was the only other thing that guys really had is that, you know what? I am taking care of my family. Being that father makes me a man. So he's already not the provider. He's not given it because of this. There's chemically it's taken away. And then with the divorce rates at, you know, climbing 50%, they say they're going down now, but that's just because people aren't getting married. The separations are still just as rampant as ever. So you've basically taken everything away. And so that's the problem is that men have nothing left and no guidance to get there. And that's where you end up with two scenarios. You either get guys that completely give up and that's your, your NEATS. I can't remember what NEATS. Do you remember what NEATS stands for? It's like not in education, employment, or training. I think that is. I think so, yeah. yeah. I think it was like, I think the um, when I was doing it, it was like uh, average frustrated chump or something, like AFC or something, I think they used, to, they used to call them. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. So that kind of stuff. You got those guys, or uh, I call them second wave MGTOW, because... First wave MGTOW were the guys that got divorced pretty brutally and just gave up on women for a while. And that's fine. The second wave were the ones that never even got up to plate. And they just like, you can't fire me. I quit. But um, where was I going with this one? Oh, yeah. And then you got the other route, which is where guys go completely over the top like a caricature. And that's where you get these internet tough guy types or what Fox Day would call a gamma male. Which, if you don't know, is essentially describing narcissistic personality disorder. So it's it's a very multi. Ooh, I'm going to use some Jordan Peterson language here. It's a multivariant question with a lot of issues surrounding a central theme of a lack of male identity and a lack of guidance to get there. Because I really like that when um, some of your material, it was like stop being apologetic. You know, it's like we're in a society now where you wanting to become better and to become better with women is almost offensive to people. You know, and I think um, I'm probably going to mess up this, but you'd said about, um, you know, where is it that uh, you mentioned about a guy working himself by saying most don't see the dude working through his misogyny to develop an actual love of women as they really are, but they only see the toxic side of it. And I think that's the thing is now is if we start going into like wanting to become sexual beings and become better with people and dating and you know, reestablish who we are as men. A lot of people don't like that because society isn't like it's not dictated that way. You know, I'm all for women having like become breadwinners and stuff like that, but it's like men have kind of we've lost hope now. We 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 haven't have something to hold on to because what how do we become like established members of society? You know, we're no longer got things to fall back on. You know. Yeah, it's institutional failure uh, from a societal level. That's the thing that bothers me too. Because, And that's like when I was going back to having that fight with the doctor. So your healthcare is supposed to be a social contract. Like you help doctors get through school. We subsidize our doctors. We put our money into healthcare. And then the idea is we invest all of our labor into this. And it's supposed to be there to get our backs and keep us healthy. But they're not doing their job. Same thing as government. Government is bending over backwards in most countries to make things better for women when it's pretty standard to see that women have completely equal chances at doing whatever they want to do. And some cases they even get like subsidized for it. So the government isn't really doing its one central role, which is to care for its citizens in the, you know, we can argue about that from political standpoint, but I don't really care to do that. Mm -hmm, um where else do we go yeah police you can go and this is going to be some mra talking points i hate the men's right thing i think it's very impotent but it is helping to illustrate the point here where if uh a guy's wife starts beating the crap out of him and he calls the cops that he'll get arrested little things like that and so there's all these different situations where guys are basically being let down by all of the institutions that are failing their portion of the social contract and it's definitely which also yeah, and that sucks because what else are you going to get there if a guy doesn't feel engaged with the society at all? You end up you're going to end up getting a bunch of narcissistic antisocial people who just all right, fine. Well, if you don't care for me, I don't care for you, and that's how you get. And I think that's a factor in these. I'm sure you've seen it where uh, that guy in Toronto last year took a van, ran over a bunch of people because he couldn't get a woman, or the guy who started shooting up a bunch of uh, women having appies in the restaurants over in. 
Yorkdale, I think it was, or Koreatown or whatever. I'm sure, and there's a lot of examples everywhere. So, I mean, is, is that like an example would be probably like the the way some of the me- the media portrays, you know, like I hate the phrase toxic masculinity. You know, sometimes I think it's just guys acting up because they don't know how to. I'm trying not to be Elliot. I'm I'm trying not to be Elliot Hulse, but you know, channel their mask, their masculine energy. They don't know how to be guys in a modern society that's changed from when our grandpas and our fathers were there. You know, I mean, yeah. And nobody's and nobody's taking the reins on that one. I think the closest we've come so far is like Jordan Peterson and then myself. And I'm sweet fuck all, so it doesn't really count for much. I guess Rolo, he's kind of a big deal still, but even. Like outside of our small little corner of the internet, nobody knows who any of us are. So, how do you deal with you know? Like, does it bother you the way that you know, like these the red pill pickup and all that is seen by people as like sleazy and stuff like that? Because like I know the benefits I got from it. Like I became a much more confident person. I saw like development and evolution in myself. You know, I wasn't using women. I wasn't gonna. But you know, I used like the evolution of myself to become a better person that attracted more women. But I can see from uh, some people's point of views that there is some guys that use and abuse it. But, you know, what? like, do you, I, I remember reading one of your blog posts about... Oh, they just screwed up. And it doesn't matter what it is. You got to put them in a church and they'd screw that up too. I mean, but you're right. That's the thing. Like, it doesn't bother me because it's the same as having, like, uh, the guy with a dead bedroom and a nagging wife. It's not her fault. She's just running off of her firmware. I tend to treat the media the same way you would treat a girlfriend. So yeah, they're going to talk a bunch of crap and all you can really do is be the change you want to see. So I do my best to help as many guys as I can get their act together and do the best they can set the best example I can. And at the end of the day, people are going to think what they think. So, cause this is the thing is like, if you're getting, uh, I don't think who said it, but there was a quote that said, if you're getting haters, you're doing something right. You know, you'll never please everybody. And if you are, then your stuff's not honest enough. It's not open enough. You're not really pushing the boundary of what you could do. And that's what I liked yeah. about your stuff was, you know, you're not apologetic. You see it as it needs it. You know, there's some people like in this sort of pickup community who they start believing their own shite. You know, they start going and you go in and see them and they st- they go from like concrete action steps to suddenly doing videos about all, you know, the head in the cloud stuff. And if you're a guy who's just, you know, if, you, if, you, if you've not dated anybody before or you've come out of a bad relationship or you've got some toxic friends and stuff, like, you know, all you want is how to be, go out, how to put a smile on your face, meet a couple of girls, have a laugh, how to become, you know, centered almost and just be yourself. You don't want to be hearing about like all this fucking awkward toll shite and all that. You know, you just want to be able to go, what do I do? What's three steps I can do tonight to go out and be myself again? You know, so- well, I, I, would, I, I know it's a semantic thing, but I absolutely hate people when they say be yourself. Maybe yourself is a bag of shit and maybe yourself needs to get better. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but I get what you're I get what you're saying. Uh, sadly, I was that so when I first started it, I was like, you know, wouldn't say boo to a goose and like, you know, I kind of had a couple of date um girlfriends before then who and it was all kind of I was trying to please them. I was always trying to be the guy that, you know, I kind of changed myself almost to kind of keep them happy. And when I look back now, it's laughable. It's like somebody else, but I can see it happening with friends and I can see it happening with work colleagues that there's a completely different side of them, you know, and like I do um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu now. Right. And you become so in the moment and, you know, it's the physicalness of it and the, it's, well, yeah, if you're not in the moment, your leg, your ankle lock's going to really hurt. Uh, you know what I mean? It's like you become so in tune with everything and you forget everything else and it's what's happening and what's happening right in front of you and the guy on top try to choke you out and all this kind of stuff. And you go out and it's like you're so attuned to the world. Try not to be... Well, you're, you're observing. You're actually paying attention to what's going on around you instead of living in your head. Uh, and is that is that the kind of shit you see with guys that you work with and the guys you chat to? You know, Do you see the problems because they're rolling this shit through the prison in their mind rather than just being part of that moment? 
is it using too many phones? Is it online dating? You know, what kind of things would you attune this? Because I think I read somewhere that the average American hasn't made a new friend in five years. The, av- the, amount, the amount of sex that um, guys, like are married couples and single guys in like, today's environment aren't having sex, you know, nearly as much as last year. You know, what, what's causing all this shite? Is it, you know, is it, I know it's society and the way things are set up, but I mean, is it that our diets are poor? We're not sleeping. What do you mean? Like specifically, like why does Joe Blow not getting it? Or why is the average of Joe Blow not getting it happening? Like, why is it going Would up? you say it's their diet's too poor, that they're not exercising, that they're not meditating? Oh, in America, I'd say the diet is huge. I cannot believe... Like, uh, have you been to the States before or no? Um, yeah. I've um, been to San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gee, you pulled <laughs> I remember, it's the weirdest thing. Like, I've been up and down the West Coast and up across the northern states there and a lot of the East Coast. Basically, everybody but the heartland. And I'm just amazed at how fat that place is. Like, even the thin people are fat. It's just crazy. Granted, there, there's muscular people too, but I know that diet is huge. The fact that I see a lot of guys and bigger guys too, and their testosterone levels are about a third of what they should be. So I know diet on that is huge. I know there's an isolation thing that guys are getting because it's not like the old days where a guy would have a church and a smaller community. You're in these giant, you know, 10 million plus cities. It's hard to make a friend and then everybody's becoming more isolated. So I get that, but the thing I don't like about it, and it ties into the same thing I said before by what do you want? So if you want social integration, you kind of have to go out and get it. We don't really have a system in place to handle what happens when you're online with Xbox 20 hours a day. So a guy has to be more deliberate with how he structures his life. A girl doesn't have to worry about that because, you know, guys always want a girl's attention. As long as she's not a zero out of 10, she'll pretty much find something. So they kind of get saved from their own bad choices. Guys just have to be deliberate. And then, I mean, you get lucky. You'll have guys that join gyms, like a mixed martial arts gym and that. You'll start making some friends there. And as far as the societal level, it's just we threw out the baby with the bathwater. We were so worried about getting rid of fraternities, gentlemen's clubs, the Shriners, the Boy Scouts. There's just really nothing left to give guys an idea on how to make their own. Like even the Legion. I don't think, I don't know if they have it in the States too, but did you know in the Legion, you don't actually have to, like there's no military people running the Legion. In Canada. How does that work? I have no idea. Well, I remember technically it was because the World War II vets thought the Korean War vets didn't count. So they kept a lot of them out. And so then they just had, as soon as the World War II vets died off, there was a huge glut where there was nobody there to join. And so they started letting in wives of military people and kids of military people. And eventually it was just, yeah, we just need people sign up. And so then military people just all left and nobody signs up to there anymore. Sure. And so I think it's kind of like the same phenomenon that happened with the average guys is that whatever they had, their version of like a civilian legion is gone. Your church, your gyms, your boys clubs, whatever. And so now they just had nothing left and they don't know how to start one. And it's there's been enough generations since that I don't even think people were aware of how good they can be. Because it's almost like we've gone, we're so afraid of insulting one or two people or two or three types of people that we've, we've now destroyed everybody by removing who we are. You know, you see it in like, I hate the term, but civilized societies like United States, America, um, then you've got like UK, but you know, like all these kind of cultural places. Like, you know, I walk down the yeah, street yeah. here and I'll see guys with, no arse basically because they, they don't go to the gym where the girlfriend might be walking there and she's got like thicker thighs than him he's wearing tighter jeans and <laughs> it, it just bugs I me that too. Yeah, when i was a kid i remember girls were like i would never date a guy who fits smaller pants than me <laughs> that was like that was like a guy owning a little dog it was just not on like I come out and I see these guys, like we come out to like say jujitsu and you know, you're so attuned to the world and you like, you know, you're sweaty and you know, all that kind of stuff, but you feel like you're in that moment. It's the best feeling in the world. And I see these guys standing there and they're like, you know, smoking the vape pens and they're trying to impress other people and giving a toss what somebody else is thinking. And it's so sad to see, you know, they're, 
buying shit and going to the pubs and all that, and you, they're not really having a good time. And I just don't see that point of a life where you're having to be pretend to be somebody to impress somebody that you don't truly like. But this is why why I started the podcast. Really, I I was going through this phase of I went to the pub with my friends up where I was originally from. Absolutely was hating it. I got so bored, wasn't interested in conversations, didn't give a toss about what was happening. I knew there was more to life. and I had It was to, just a routine for you. Yeah, I, ha- I had to step away. And you alienate people because it's scary for them. It's like the crabs in the bucket. They don't want you to leave because it means that if you can do it and be successful, that scares them because then it means, well, why? what's stopping them doing it? And they would rather have the safe knowledge that, oh, no, no, you know, he failed. That means I can pretend I don't need to go away. You know, it's, yeah, it, everybody will fail, so why bother trying? It gives them that, that comfort. Um, so how did you manage that? You know, like, were you at that point of uh, everything was so bad, you know, like it was at that level that you just thought nah, enough's enough? If somebody was listening to this just now and has come out like a shitty relationship, doesn't have any friends, in a job that pays, but, you know, they're not ecstatic, how would you start working with them? You know, where should they go in that sense? Well, if they listened and did everything I told them to, I would just tell them Operation Scorched Earth. If none of this is working, nuke the entire thing. You move across the country, completely upend, sell your house, quit your job, or at least make plans to get to a new one. But the most important thing is to answer the question, what do you want? And it's funny because I haven't talked to a single guy yet where I just flat out ask him when he comes, he'll give me, you can always explain his problems, like 20 minutes of ranting about who's done him wrong. Yep. But then when I ask, okay, so wave a magic wand, what happens? What do you want? And I've yet to have anybody come as quickly with an answer. Because they live, they're actually living their story. They're living, they want, that becomes part of them. That's their identity is, oh, so-and-so said this, so-and-so said that. And you're like, yeah, right, fine. Yeah, it's it's reactive. Actually, you know, the funny thing too is there's psychologically, it's the feminization of men uh, because it's, it's technically being a borderline, which if you guys don't know, it's one of those cluster B behaviors, border borderline and narcissism are kind of two extreme ends of human behavior, which narcissism is like you build your own narrative and then other people have to abide by it. And that's where you think of like the secret Kings or that story. The emperor has no clothes. I'm sure. If you've heard of that one. Yeah. So yeah, the emperor's like, I'm wearing the fanciest clothes ever, and you guys will all acknowledge it. And so that's that's what a narcissist kind of is in a story perspective. Borderline is like if the narcissist is the director, the borderline is the perfect actor. And that's the person that does what they can to fill whatever you want of them. And that's what a lot of those guys are doing now, is they're going too far into like a borderline personality disorder when they should be on the narcissist side. So if you had so, and- if you had to pick, um, oh, sorry for interrupting there, but if you had to pick people mm-hmm. who fitted into those molds, you know, who is there? Fam- two famous people, like one that would be one side and one would be the other side. You know, just to give somebody an example of like, you know, and are the people who spring to mind when you think about that kind of terminology? Well, if you want to go extreme, we just have to pick somebody with narcissistic personality disorder or borderline personality disorder. And that's the thing. So these are psychological disorders. They're not diseases. What they just do is they take a sampling of the population, 100% of the population, and they draw a bell curve to it. So who has more narcissistic personality traits and who has more borderline personality traits? And then the center of the bell curve, we'll say, is like a 5 out of 10. If you're like a 3 out of 10 to 5 out of 10, it's very effeminate. And that's when you think of like women deferring to their husbands or... Like all that stuff you would think of when you think of standard femininity. And then you think of the guy who's cocky, brash, and arrogant, but, you know, kind of fun. That's kind of the narcissistic side of things. And that's like a five to eight. Once you get outside those, you get to that third standard deviation. That's when they think, when they're like, okay, this is too far from the norms of human society that this person can't function. And that's where you get, I I can't even think of an example right now. I wish I had more celebrity knowledge, but. Was that Donald Trump sort of thing? I would say, yeah, he's probably like the top end of where you would want to be for narcissism. Because when you think about it, and I'm probably going to have a lot of people jumping on my throat on this, is that he, Donald Trump cares about Donald Trump. He loves him more than anybody else. It's that's obvious. But he's also kind of rested his legacy on, 
I will make the country great again. Now you can argue whether he's going to do that or not. doesn't really matter, but you can't argue that he's basically attached his ego to the, to the benefit of the country, or at least he thinks he does. And so that's where that healthy male level of narcissism comes in handy. And this is the same as like, take it to a family unit. You're a husband or, you know, a father, whatever. And you're the same cocky narcissistic asshole, but you know, this is your family. Nobody makes fun of my family, but me, mm-hmm. nobody touches my wife, but me, that kind of thing. As opposed to a woman who is more deferential. It's like, no, no, he, he knows what he's doing. Just trust him. Where they kind of like adopt a more, and it's something we call the captain first officer model, which is usually the most uh, stable way, I guess, to have a relationship run. And that's where the, the girl in the relationship is the first officer. So she has input, she's advisory, but at the end of the day, the captain or the guy takes on all the risk. He makes the big decisions. And that tends to be the most stable way that these things have worked out over the years. I mean, you're going to see examples where girls take charge and they have their floor mat men, but nobody tends to be happy on that one. And that's usually where infidelity comes from. And that's just female nature. They always like deferring to a high value man. And by deferring, I mean like sexually deferring. So uh, eventually if you're going to be a floor mat for the longest time and your woman's hanging around a lot of high status people, things are going to happen. Is that why like, you'll find really hot waitresses will ha- have sex with the, the geeky restaurant manager? Because in that environment, he's the like he's a high-status person. Yeah, he's got the pre-selection. That's the same thing as like you can have the ugliest rock star and he's going to get tail. Women kind of defer to authority that way, but not all authority. One authority at a time. And that's what when Rolo refers to things like hypergamy, and that's that's how you map it to your day to day life. So if you're the if you're the head bouncer at the bar, you're probably going to have a lot of girls wanting after you because you know you're the high status guy at the bar. But if she has a husband at home that she's desperate that she's awesomely in love with, she probably still defers to him, so she doesn't really affect it by it. Or uh, if you have a floor mat of a husband at home that you never have sex with because you're just not feeling desirable. Meanwhile, you have the CEO of the company on you on a corporate retreat. Naturally, you're turned on by that. So it's it's one of those neat things where as a guy, you just have to understand that she's going to defer to one man in her life. And if it's not you, then it's going to be somebody else. So on that kind of topic, if you're a guy who's in a relationship just now, you know, it could be married, it could be whatever. What are the red flags they should be looking for? You know, is there stuff that they can start noticing now to fix it before it becomes a problem? Or is the fact that it's becoming, you know, that once it starts, you can't really stop it? Well, uh, I'd say the first thing is oral sex blowjobs. And it's, we've seen it, I've seen it about 100, 200 times now, is that once guys start taking the reins back in their relationships, one of the first things they notice is the uh, amount of oral sex or, and anal goes up. It's the, cause here's the thing. Sex feels good for guys and girls. So girls can have sex because it feels good, but obviously, you know, giving a blow job doesn't feel good. What feels good is pleasing somebody that they're, you know, ravishly that they're very in love with. And so the first sign you could find that that's slipping away is those tend to hmm. go away. Oh, definitely. Uh, the other big one is open disrespect in private, whatever. Sometimes people have fights. That's normal. But if you're surrounded by a group of your peers and she's openly bashing you in front of them, that's a huge red flag there. Because in a general healthy relationship, what happens is a girl attaches her status to you. Same as I said before, like, this is my man and, you know, I got his back. Once she starts talking shit about you in front of others, that's when she no longer feels that way, whether she knows it consciously or not. So those are big red flags there. But yeah, and then generally sex is one of the other first things to fall off beyond that every guy it will always have a gut intuition about when something is wrong we've kind of been evolved for it because cavemen can't make cave babies if you know cave stacy's screwing around with cave chad <laughs> uh i don't know the science of it too well i hope it didn't get you with all that jargon there but <laughs> no, that's i mean this is why i really like your instincts because when I first seen your stuff, I thought, oh, here we go. This is another pickup guy, another, you know, one of 30 odd thousand. But I started reading <laughs> it and it made perfect sense. And this is what bugs me is that 
you're helping guys by explaining to them in a straightforward and honest way what is like such a a basic part of our thing of you know we have to pass our DNA on we have we we meet we populate we have kids and stuff like that and there's so many people that go oh no 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 you can't talk about you know getting girls that's disgusting that's da 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 and it's really sad that a lot of these guys are brought up thinking oh no I can't possibly talk to somebody about how to get better with girls I just have to take what I can get and I always just like it's supposed to be like it's supposed to be an accident. But I will yeah. correct you on the one thing. It's not, um, how did you put it there? Where you said that I said you have to do this or have to do that. I find this is the thing that I pride myself on being different with. I don't actually tell a guy what to do. I just find that for most guys, I find out what they want. Like, what do you want? And mm-hmm. a guy will say, sometimes there. it doesn't matter if it's ridiculous. Here's the thing. Even if nobody else agrees, if nobody else likes it, if everybody else thinks it's abhorrent, it's not their call to make. It's your call. You're the one who has to live with it. And unless somebody else is going to take responsibility for the consequences of your life, they don't get a say in it. And so the approach I take is, okay, so let's say, I mean, we can see that the case for getting married in the first world right now is like moot. It's completely ridiculous. You probably, you shouldn't do it, but it's not my place to tell you not to. So if you are going to do it, my approach is, okay, so here's the here's about a thousand guys that have done it. Here's what ends up happening to them at the one-year mark, at the two-year mark, at the five-year mark. Here's what they did in those situations to get out of them, and here was the general results. And so most likely, if you do X, Y, and Z, if you work out, if you uh, start being more charismatic with other people, you get out of the house more, there'll be a whole bunch of different things you can do. Then these are the likely things that have happened in the past, and these are the roadblocks you're going to have to look out for. And in the future, be prepared for this situation to happen. And so it gives the guy a confidence in, okay, so I can go after what I want and I have an idea what could go wrong and what I can do about it. So they kind of mitigate that risk. And here's the thing. And here's the best part about it because most of the time guys don't know what they want. So once you flesh out what the consequences are of what he goes after, so you can tell a guy like, I want to get married. And then you tell him, this is the problems with marriage, the seven year itch. The problem is that the hormones change after the first child or all this stuff. And then they, at the end of the day, decide that they don't want to take whatever mitigation they have to do to fix that. Then you're like, okay, well then you really don't want that. So then you kind of find out you delve deeper. And maybe the guy who says he wants a wife, he just wants it because he thinks that's the only way he can get sex on the regular. So then you can actually approach what he's actually going for and not what he says he's going for. Or if it turns out he just wants a fam- he just wants to have a kid, then you can play from there. Okay, well, then if the e- issue is these legal things here, then we can just do a common law arrangement or, you know, move to a different country because, and or a different state. Because I know some states are brutal. Like if you want to have a marriage, I think California is probably the worst state to have it in. I know there's some that are better, but that's the thing. So then if you really want to get married enough, and I, like I said, I won't recommend it, you at least know where you would have to go to make that the best option. Or if you want to just pick mm-hmm. up girls, well, I'm living in San Francisco right now, which is a horrible ratio of men to women. It's all nerds and nobody's attractive. So then you clearly don't want to live in San Francisco, move to a nicer city. But then they're like, but I really like this job here. So like, okay, so then you don't actually want to pick up hotter women. You just want to complain about it. And then sort out exactly what the guy's looking for in life. And then what you'll find is that most guys will either accept that they aren't willing to change their circumstances and take the risk, in which case they just stop complaining about it and live with the consequences of their decisions or they start making hard decisions, but they don't really know it until they actually understand what they're even asking. Does that make sense? I know that answer to that's like a Rolo answer without periods or anything. Now this seems like a great place to take a quick break. Just wanted to let you know that I've set up some awesome deals with some amazing companies. There are so many special offers, listener exclusives, deals and discount codes available. Simply go to www.nextlevelguy.com forward slash affiliates. That's www.nextlevelguy.com forward slash affiliates. Or if you're on the site itself, simply click on affiliate deals in the blue banner at the top of the page. This will take you to the special location where I store all my um, deals. You'll find all the exclusive offers, discount codes, etc. available from here. You will find that when you click on them, you'll be taken to a new page. And 
you'll buy directly from the company itself. I don't get any information on what you purchase. I don't get any um, data or downloads or anything information on what you do. All I get is a small commission from the company for sending you through using my links. All monies I get are then sent back into the site to make it better for you. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to this waffle. Now, let's get back to the interview. No, I absolutely love that. I mean, I love the way that you look at it. It's like, okay, what do you want? Okay, and you ask a question. And then it's the way that you immediately kind of, it's concrete and it's just straight to the point. It's not like, yeah, well, go away and meditate for three weeks and then come back and journal for 10 minutes every day. Then, you know, come away and do yoga. You know, you kind of just go, you get to the, the, the you know, the, the actual crux of the problem straight away. And a lot of guys think, oh, I want to get married. Why? Because everybody else is doing it. Oh, I want to get married because it makes, yeah, every, you know, I should be doing that as a safe bet. Like, you know, it won't make them happy, but it'll make them feel like they're what society accept, you know, expects of you. So, or worse yet, they don't even think about it. They just kind of go through the motions because it's easier than having to think, making these hard decisions because you might make the wrong one. Uh, and you end up with If somebody. you make the wrong decision and it's somebody else's choice, then it's their fault. But if you make the wrong decision and it's you did it, then it's your fault. And I think people are terrified of that. Even though, like, we're not going to die anymore. Do you know how hard it is to die today? Mm. Like, it's hard. I, there's people that jump off of roofs, break their necks, and they still get brought back to life. There's guys that get shot, stabbed. They're coming back. Like, it's very hard to die. We're very good at keeping you alive. Like, there, when was the last famine or, like, uh, depression era starvation? That was, like, in the 20s. Nah. So for 100 years, nobody starved in the streets. Like, you'll be fine. There's no way you can screw it up more than, like, enough to kill yourself. So... Well, you didn't have enough like that. That's that's maybe a problem nowadays. Is there isn't our like there isn't our big war really. There isn't our real call to be be somebody or really need to go out and be the person that you're in. You are within yourself, and yeah, exactly. Nobody else is going to give you a mission in life. You have to come up with your own. Yeah, I think it was um, Ryan Mickler at um, Order of Men. Um, podcast where he was talking about the need for rituals, the need for having like you know something uh, like a, a something in your life that makes you actually want to go off and do stuff. You know, like uh, have your own mission rather than letting somebody else dictate it for you. And for a lot of guys, it's easier just picking a girlfriend who, yeah, maybe gets it a bit here and there. You're kind of happy, but she'll tell you what to do she'll control the relationship she'll control what you do who you see in that and it's safer it's more comfortable you know they don't need to think about themselves they don't need to worry and before they know it they're 60 odd life's disappeared they're 70 you know 80 they're close to death and they think what have i done but yeah and you know the worst part of that is too is like you if you're gonna make your mission like you're gonna sign your hitch your wagon onto a girl's mission and then you're going to act surprised when she does something in her own best interest instead of yours. It's like, what were you? What did you think was going to happen? Well, there's so many guys like myself just now who are now single. You know, they've they're not sure what they're going to do next. Like, but you know, maybe they've got the good job. They've got kind of some good mates. Um, like, say, I've, I mean, I've made a heap of great pals from jujitsu. Um, I've, I've just bought, yeah. I've just bought my own flat. I've got the job that's really good. I want to go out and start meeting girls. Um, what is it? Should I look at my dating life retrospectively, and should I be thinking the kind of girls I went for? Look at problems, or is it better just to say, "Okay, that's learning curves," and look at the future? You know, do you bother going deeper into like previous problems with you know and looking for clients' issues, or is it um, only for an after-action report? The only thing I'll say as far as like looking at past relationships is if you have a type, because most guys tend to attract a certain type of girl. Like you'll find that guys never date the girl next door. And then the next girlfriend's a goth girl. It's always, they always date goth girls because whatever they do tends to attract those kind of girls or BPD girls or cluster B girls. Those ones are the worst. Cause if you're a codependent guy, you are like catnip to a, to a BPD girl or a cluster B. So I would say yes, in the sense that if all you're attracting is the kind of women that take advantage of you, then there's clearly something about you that makes you look like a mark. But beyond that, I don't like navel gazing too much about it. Because that's the thing, isn't it? 
Except for just some broad strokes. Yeah, just like a quick, quick after action report. Okay, so what's been going wrong? What was wrong with X, Y, and Z girl? And then move on from there. And that's just learning from your own mistakes. But you should be, I mean, naturally, you're kind of doing that anyway, if you've been, you know, paying attention to your life. Well, there's a lot of guys who don't, you know, you see them and it's the same girl babe, with a just different name and you think, can they not see that? And you, you want to say to friends, but sometimes it, you think, well, it's better for them to find out for themselves or, you know, you look like you're... Yeah, they have to learn the hard way. <laughs> you know, like you look like you're being the, the prick who jumps in the middle, right? Where you want to say to people, like, you know, she's not right for you. But they're kind of happy-ish. But then I see a lot of guys, like, I work with and, you know, I like I work in a university and there's a lot of kind of because these guys are intelligent but they don't know they haven't got any people skills and you know a lot of times you can see them married and they're, they're just not happy and you know i just i don't want to get to that situation or be with somebody that doesn't make me happy and i've kind of had times when i could have gone and got laid plenty of times you know like the one night stands but it's with people that i knew i wouldn't respect myself for going with and what it's like eight hours you need to respect you can respect somebody overnight no. that's you know what you know what i mean so that when i first when i first started and now i it's i'm attracting the people that i would like i want to be with i want to share experiences with you know a lot of them sexual but i've i went through a period of when i first started this job of being stressed and stuff and i stopped going out and now i'm like a lot of guys of how do you pick this back up how do you go out again like what kind of mission should you have yeah i don't like these kind of stock pickup lines you know what i mean you know like how what, what kind of mentality should i be going out with what kind of things should guys be going out going out just looking for friends looking to get laid you know well i always like going out with a purpose so if you're doing day game or night game you're going out to to practice uh, I'm going to sound totally dated here because it's like the mystery method where you have your three phases and each phase is three sub phases, your attraction, your openers, your seduction phase. And so I, when I, when I was first going out, that was my plan. Like, all right, I'm going to get my openers down pat. Okay. Then after this, I want to get, you know, my ability to keno escalate down pat. And then afterwards, like bring a girl back to my place and have the logistics down pat. And so it was always just about having it as a skill and it's making a promise to took the you of tomorrow that look i obviously don't know exactly what i want right now so i'm going to put myself on the best foot forward so that i but when i do figure it out a year from now and that's your job tomorrow you that uh you're going to have enough options to be able to pick what you want and i think that's the easiest way to go about it then you don't think about it too much you're not afraid to get started because what if it's the wrong goal or what if you need to pivot or whatever you're just like, look, I'm going to get better at picking up girls right now, or I'm going to get better at making friends right now. And then once you have that moment of inspiration, we realize, oh, I get it. I want to have three friends with benefits and then get back to work. And then you can focus on that. But until you get there, all you can really do is like, all right, I'll just keep my options open. So I don't like going out and then kind of winging it. Definitely go out with a plan in mind and like I said, I'm not a big bar guy anymore. So for pubs, it's usually to be social with people. But if the opportunity presents itself to go and talk to somebody new, I'll take it. So would you be looking at like things like meet apps and, you know, like um, these kind of uh, social like apps, you know, where like meetup.com, for example, you know, you always find groups that like play guitar or go to gigs together. You know, is that that kind of thing you be getting guys to do where you're meeting people who are who they're going to be naturally attracted to who have got the same kind of vibe as them yeah well as far as like hobby friends those are those are activity friends and that's always good to get but if you want to take let's say an activity friend like that what you're saying do your meetups if you want to turn those into actual friends what you have to do is you'll find like you'll find the same person at more than one different activity and so once you have i think the magic number was three once you have the same person in three different spheres then you're generally going to have a closer friendship than an activity partner would have. So for example, in Victoria, BC, where I was from, I was part of a rock climbing group. And then I obviously worked with the military. So I had a lot of like the military social circle there. And then there was the pickup side or, and then eventually you would see one person in more than one or two of these places. And that's where you could kind of build a friendship up from. 
But yeah, for guilt, those single places, at the very least, you need to learn how to be social. I think I just released a video today on telling guys that uh, women should be the seventh biggest priority in your life. And that was kind of part of it. Yeah, just like go out, be social, not because you want anything out of it, but you need to get better at being social. So when you do find somebody that's worth a damn, you're actually charming enough that you're worth a damn to them too. Because I think that scared me one day. I woke up and it was like, what the hell is going on? And I actually generally stopped and thought, nearly all the guys I was friendly with, they're all like long-term relationships, never really coming out anymore. The people that I was sort of seen regularly, I knew they weren't really, you know, it wasn't, they didn't have my best interests at heart. It was kind of, they just wanted somebody to go to the pub with and keep, you know, just they wanted to be entertained enough that they filled the void. So how do we get to that point of making great friends? And, you know, should it be a case of you go out looking to make friends at the same time you're looking to meet women as you're picking up new hobbies? Or should you just be focusing on that kind of, you know, like if you're wanting to get better with women, should you be mixing it up with, how you know, like getting hobbies, becoming more attractive in that sense, making new friends? Yeah, I've never seen a guy go to pick up women and not have any more time in his day to learn to play the guitar or get a job at a nightclub or something. Yeah. Like, I don't get this whole single utility thing. Like, it's nothing stopping you from that during day game. If you want to do some day game approaches, what do you need? An hour every two days? It's like a workout. You can find a way to work out and find a hobby. So just work on them all. And you'll get, it may not, because you can only focus so much. I don't think any guy is going to sit out there and do eight hours of approaches. So you just do one hour of approaches and then you go back to whatever your hobbies are. But work on it all. You got tons of time. Because you see that in the pickup thing, because that's what used to drive me crazy. People go, yeah, okay, I'm going to go out uh, like uh, at least four nights a week and I'm going to go and approach like every girl and I'm going to go out and I'm going to pick a girl home every night. And then you, know, could you hear the panic? Like, you know, these like all the newbies were coming in and they were setting themselves like such unrealistic goals. Yeah. And I was thinking, yeah, no, I'm just going to go and chat to the cashier. Oh, she's quite cute. I'll see what happens here. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I'll go chat to that girl, jiu jitsu. And that worked for me because it was a kind of, well, if I don't get any, if I, if somebody I don't fancy, they're still going to make a friend out of it. I'm still going to have a, you know, maybe make their day a bit better, make my day a bit better, make that interaction a bit, you know, like pot past the time. Well, you broke the problem down into discrete chunks that are, because like you said, just I'm going to sleep with three women tonight. That's an unrealistic goal because you have nothing in between you leaving your house and you coming home with them. But yours, I'm going to go out and approach some people. I'm going to go talk to three people tonight. Those are those are bite-sized, discrete chunks, and it's hard. You can't bullshit yourself. Like, you're going to know if you went and started talking to some waiters and or some waitresses at the bar and make friends, which you should do anyway. They're very easy people to make friends with, and I remember a lot of my regular places, like, I got fairly close with a lot of the uh, staff there. I even got offered a job once, which was kind of cool. And then three drinks. And you're that guy that knows the high status people there. So that works out for you as well. But you're right. But then at that goal, then you can build off of that goal. So I went from there to maybe then approaching some strangers and then maybe trying to do a makeout and then maybe getting a number and then having that maybe taking one home. But you're right. As soon as you broke it down into smaller achievable steps, then you can actually work towards it better. And instead of having three months of getting shot down four nights a week, you have two and a half months of not getting shot down, but building up a foundation. And then one month of, you know, getting shot down half the time, but the other half of the time are, you know, good for you. And is this why guys fail, do you think, when they come into this sort of new kind of mentality and look outlook on life, that they're so keen to get it that they set, the, you know, unmanageable goals for themselves? They think, you yeah, know, oh, I'm going to do that. And oh, I like that. And oh, I've read about this. I'm going to try that rather than just going baby steps and thinking, yeah. Oh, yeah, they're all hooked on the feelings. This feels great. I feel like, man, I'm going to go fuck some sluts. And you're just like, oh, for crying out loud, dude, like, slow it down. <laughs> slow it down. Right now, a stiff breeze will push you over. Let's work on some other things first. <laughs> but I think it's sabotage, honestly, because I know a lot of guys, if you're doing that, you're essentially setting yourself up for failure. So even if it's not on purpose, you're sabotaging yourself. Yeah, I've just realized we've been talking for almost an hour and it feels like 10 minutes. Like that, You're the kind of guy that I could, I could sit and chat to for ages because I think you're very open, you're very honest. And when I was reading your stuff, it was very kind of, 
it was it actually made me realize stuff straight away. You know, like your tweets just cut through the chaff, and you, you said exactly what you meant. There was no kind of well, I'll appease them with a wee bit with this, a wee bit that. You know, and I could see where some you might have a few a few hairs from it, but that's the thing. <laughs> that's an understatement. <laughs> you're definitely setting up people. You're you're showing them how it can be. You know, I think you're opening up that avenue of this is the kind of guys we can be again. And they're the guys that girls are attracted to. You know, I I started hating the pickup side of things because it, you know, it was into that, like, oh, that girl's a seven. Oh, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this line. I'm going to try this protocol and all that. Oh, yeah, that's crap. Uh, annoying. I hate that. Like, oh, she's slightly too ch- something for me, so I can't do it. Like, fuck off. I, I just went by a thing of zero or one. Am I attracted to her? No. Then she'll be a friend. If, or, you know, she'll be somebody to chat to. And if I was attracted to her, I would chat to her. If I still was attracted, I would say, do I go for a coffee? And when I was that version of myself, I had great success. But when I started getting into, you know, oh, when I started getting into it and caring about it too much, I went to shit and then I got a long-term girlfriend and now I'm back at, at that moment of I've got my life kind of set up like a lot of guys have and now they're going, shit, yeah. how, how do, how do I make it. friends? How do I go out and meet girls? How do I, you know, be, do the basic things that a guy's there is to pass it to you. Yeah, and if you've been a good employee for as long as you have and a hard worker, these are going to be a completely new skill set for you. And so that's the and that's the thing you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable about it, because that's which is I think a lot of parts where guys fail too. And this is the part where it looks like you're succeeding is because a lot of guys once they're uncomfortable they hide where they're comfortable. So you would just like ah oh, I can't go out tonight I'm gonna go back to work. You don't really have to go to work, but you just don't like the feeling of being uncomfortable. When in reality you're not growing unless you're uncomfortable. That discomfort is your body's way of saying it. Same as like when you work out. You're not working out if your muscles aren't tired at the end of it. So how do you get somebody who's maybe never been out socially in ages? How would you get like, you know, becoming comfortable in like a a vibrant pub or a club or something like that? Would you just avoid getting them to go down that road? Or is there like social... Oh, baby steps. Yeah, I'm trying how 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 to word it nicely, but you know, people who who stand in a corner with a drink to their chest, you know, oh, I'm out. That's good enough. But they, they're like well, a stat. They're like um, the guy from the Adams family, you know, like Lurch. Yeah. How, how do you get them to be themselves, but put them in a situation where like maybe they're in a pub or something? Where they can actually succeed or grow? Yeah. I'd say there's two techniques to this. One is baby steps. So, and there's something I've loved. They've had it around since like mystery did it in the early nineties. It's just about uh, approach anxiety. You go ask 50 people for the time of day. And that's all you're doing. And what that does is it helps. It gives a guy a structure saying, it's like, look, you're going to walk up to the stranger. This is how the conversation is going to go. You're going to say, excuse me, do you have the time? They're going to give the time and you're going to say, thank you very much. Or they don't have a watch. You're like, oh, okay, sorry to bother you. So they know how that interaction is going to go. They're not invested in it, but they're still going to have that same approach anxiety by approaching them. But since the consequence is basically removed, it's like a simulated social interaction. And so after doing 50 or 100 of those, people kind of start going numb to it. The other thing that I usually have people do is set like have them assume failure from the onset. I've had a couple of clients doing this where their first time running game in that and they don't want to know, do I ask this girl out, yada, yada. I'm like, look, you're going to screw this up. And they do screw it up. So I'm like, now that you know you're going to screw it up, Go screw it up and learn something from it. Like my one client is the best of this one. He was doing the same thing. He was getting back on the horse, talking to a girl, but he was doing the same thing that any guy would do when he's orbiting a girl that he's friends with, hoping that she'll show interest instead of taking the charge. I think he invited her to like a huge elaborate, like uh, medieval times dinner. And the problem with that is that girls don't like being the center of attention if they just met mm. you. So when you take a girl to dinner, that shows an overinvestment on your part and she'll pull away as opposed to what you should be doing, which is just like as little investment as possible. And then you let her and then you up your investment as she ups hers. And that's where I say. So, yeah, and I say we pass the approach to anxiety. We're doing a date. All right. So wherever you meet her, you just say, say you meet her in a park, a public place to have a conversation for a minute about whatever the hell you want to have. Doesn't matter. 
And then after that, if you find out that she's not crazy or psycho or, you know, secretly a man, if that's your thing, great. If not, whatever. Then you're like, hey, this has been a lot of fun. Come walk with me. We'll keep chatting again. And then that escalates further. You go to, let's say, a Starbucks. And then you hang out there for a bit. It's slightly more intimate, slightly more of a focus on her, but not a lot. It's still very casual. Maybe you'll, you know, do some light Kino or touch a girl's arm to let you know that, you know, you could touch somebody without being a complete creeper. And then if that one starts going really well, she starts showing you some interest. Maybe you escalate from there. It's like, yeah, I was going to go meet some buddies at a pub. Why don't you come with me instead? And So then the whole idea is you never escalate further than you're comfortable with. And the other girl is showing that she's equally engaged. I love that. Does that make Definitely. sense? Yeah. It also helps you work on your logistics too, because a lot of guys, they, they want to go out and have sex, but they have no idea how to make it seamless. Cause a girl, they're kind of like deer this way. They're very skittish. So if you all of a sudden are like scrambling at the last minute to come up with a plan to have sex, she's probably just going to, you know, I, this isn't right. I'm just going to get out of here. They like a guy who is under control and takes charge to them. It just seems like magical and things just happen, but they don't realize that behind the scenes, you're putting a ton of work in. So for example, if you live with your parents, that's a barrier you have to get past. Maybe you end up having to have sex in your car. Maybe you have a buddy's place. Who's not there and you borrow it from him. Maybe if you have roommates, you let your roommate know, maybe you decide then to go out and have fun at places that are within walking distance to your place. So when you have a couple drinks, you can't be like, oh, I can't drive. I got to catch a cab. And then catching a cab is like catching a ho- getting a hotel room. It kind of puts that same expectation on a girl and it kind of makes them skittish. So the idea is you want to make everybody very comfortable, have a lot of fun through your logistics planning. And then as you do these small, emotionally invested escalations, that forces you to think about those logistics while you're thinking on your game and everything starts to flow naturally after a while. Now you're going to screw up like the first hundred or two. I know God knows I did, but you eventually get there. This is why I couldn't understand why you like your stuff wasn't massive, you know, like compared to some of these other like airy fairy dating guys, you know, because when I look at your stuff, like just some of your articles and some of your tweets, it just realigned that, I was right thinking some of the stuff, you know, and I can, I can see why some people have the issues, but you know, it's like yeah. just the way you've outlined that alone has probably changed and transformed so many guys, you know, guys who are sitting there just now going, am I, I hope so. am I too old to date? Do looks matter? Do I have to have a big bank account to meet girls? You know, oh, I need to impress this girl. I'm going to take her to a fancy restaurant where, do you know what I love about those questions? You just answer them like, I don't know, go find out. <laughs> ah, and that's what bugs me. It's like, it's again, it's like, I'm going to ask you a question because it feels like I'm doing something, but just enough for yeah. you to do something like back. So it feels like I'm part of this conversation or I'm part of this action, but I don't, I'm not actually going to go do what you've said to me because if I say, if we talk it, at least that's enough. It looks like I'm invested into it, you know? And that's why yeah, it's the New Year's resolution syndrome. But, where when you make that new year's resolution it gives you the same dopamine high that actually doing the thing does and so you end up being less likely to actually commit to what you were trying to do and it, it's by it's short it's short circusing your ability to actually succeed and is this the kind of thing you see constantly in all kind of guys you know is there a kind of a standard problem that you see with guys of like Caucasians, African Americans, Asians, or is it oh, the world over, man? It's the same thing everywhere. A guy will, instead of striving to be better at admitting that parts of himself aren't there yet, he would rather alter his perception of reality to make him the best. I use that alpha male example, which I find is ridiculous, but it'll illustrate the point. Definitely. Here, where a guy will take whatever he's doing and map that to mean whatever an alpha male means. So if a guy's a good father with a great job, but sexually he's ridiculous and he's a fat fuck, he's going to say alpha men are, are good dads. When in reality, the kind of man that you're referring to is the kind of men that men want to be and girls want to be around. As opposed to, well, what I'm doing already is perfect. It's a just be yourself thing. And that's why I really hate it. Because like you said yourself, those guys that have really good jobs are like, you know what? A real man has a great job. Fat guys are like, you know what? A real man does this other thing that doesn't involve me losing weight. It's whatever you're already doing is perfect. It just drives me nuts. 
So I'm like, dude, you're failing. Bullshit yourself, but don't try and bullshit me. Mm-hmm. And you see that, do you? It's like guys who are coming out and going, oh, yeah, you know, you have to be, att- you have to have great looks to be attractive. And then you see the guy coming out yeah. who looks like he's head back the bus, you know, and there he's meeting women because he's just himself. And that's the difference is, it's like once you start trying to impress somebody, you're doomed for failure. And I, I love that. Oh, I yeah. love that phrase that you put in one of your posts about, um, oh, what was it, about men f- men fear being uh, looking like they're homosexual and miss out on so uh, so much of the good points in life. And I, 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 oh, yeah, I, I just love I loved that. It was like the idea of like, you know, it's very true. You know, it's like all these kind of stuff and like manicures and pedicures. and But then there's all this other stuff of like, how many guys do you know that will hug each other? Like it scares them shitless because of somebody might make a joke about them or it's they might get accused of being homosexual or something, you know. And like, I'm yeah, and like I agree. If you if you cup them in the butt or like pat them on the front longer than two seconds, then maybe you got an argument, but just for like a normal hug with a good friend, like, fuck that. I just don't get that. I mean, this is why I find your uh, like, I've really chuffed and I found your stuff because initially I got into the kind of pickup because I wanted to get meet girls, become more confident. But it also helped me start developing myself. And your stuff was the first I've stuff I found in a while that's concrete and is actionable. Um, and you're like... Oh, I'm glad to hear that. You're like RSD Max, another guy who I've interviewed, where it was like, you're not up in the clouds. You're just, this is how we're going to do it. You want to change your, your story, your problem? Right, let's do it. You know, But you get to the root of the problem. You're not just there to blow smoke up your own arse. You're there to actually help people. And that's what bugs me is when I see some of the negative reactions you were getting. It was completely unwarranted. Oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> there, some of them are kind of funny. Every now and then, one guy will come up with some hate, but it actually is clever and it does make me laugh. Does ever like? That's the thing that bothers me the most is when they're very uncreative. <laughs> like, but I, mean, I go back to that thing I was saying earlier. Is like if you haven't got a hair, you're not doing it right. You know. It's, I remember got to, I did uh, my first big interview with Ella Hills years ago, and uh, it was one of these things. It got recorded. He put it up, and I was getting heaps of comments, and my site was going mental. And one guy came up and said, I don't like this Scottish guy. I don't like his accent. I was just I was like completely out of the blue, and I thought, well, I can't do shit about that. You know, but that, that was him. He just didn't like somebody else being, you know, getting success. So to him, to make himself feel better, it's like an ad hodem attack, you know. Um, I f- you know, it's we've literally been talking for about one minute, one hour and t- eleven minutes, and it feels like it feels like I've not even touched the surface. You're so easy to chat to. I can I can certainly understand how guys develop themselves with you. You know, oh, have you got so. a favorite kind of? Have you got a favorite client transformation or something that you've seen in somebody that has really sort of inspired you? Well, I would say yes. This one isn't a client. He was actually a peer. He was, I helped him out a bit, but this is before I started doing this full time. Um, his Reddit name was ex, as an ex addict, bro. He was essentially, I can't remember if it was alcohol or drugs at the time, but he essentially made a hard stop and he had to make probably the hardest choices I've seen out of just about anybody in the manosphere. So he chose to uh, sacrifice his ability to be with his kids full time in order to be a better man. And then at the back end, he's managed to fix that up. But I've never seen a man make a harder choice for the benefit of everybody around him than to essentially give up his kids in a custody battle to a girl that was clearly crazy. So that's the one guy I really do like looking up to. I'm actually, I'm hoping to meet him when I head down to Poland here in July. It'll be really cool. Same thing as I call him my, uh, my red pill brother, Bogey D6. He's another moderator at the married red pill. He and I started about the same time. He and I had a very similar problem. And I remember he's one of the few guys that he just took his ego completely out of the equation to the point where he would have to read like Rolo or Athel K in a parking lot because he had to get out of his house because his wife was that brutal towards him. Like by candlelight, he'd have to read the books there and he would just go for hours hiding in this parking lot. Same as me, how I'd like be hidden at the gym for hours a day just to do reading in between workouts and that. And I kind of like that the guy who's willing to like focus on his mission above his ego, above his pride and to put enough work in and, 
every time I see that, and there's a bunch of examples. Those are just the, the biggest two because those are probably like the first two that I've known about, but like every day I see them. And so I know you see a lot of guys throwing hate for whatever reasons at me, but I know at the end of the day, and I can't even take credit for it. I can just offer a little bit of guidance, but the guys have to do the work. But they're kind of the reason that I don't really take the any internet hate too seriously. Because at the end of the day, like these guys aren't helping anybody. I mean, is that one of the things I used to hate hearing was, you know, take your ego out of it. You know, I, I like the fact that, you know, sometimes you have to step back to go two steps forward. But is that possible? You know, like, is taking the your ego out actually removing your personality? Are you beca- Well, here's the thing. This is where the anger comes in. I know a lot of guys, when you hate on all the stuff that we do here, it's usually because guys are angry. That's more often than not the very first accusation levied at guys. The thing about that anger, though, is it's kind of necessary. Because like you said yourself, a lot of guys just get used to the routine. They don't want to change. They'll make excuses. That's because your bla- your brain is largely plastic. Or I think I always get this mixed up. Plastic or not plastic. The one where it's not malleable. I'll just say plastic. If I get it wrong, you can fix it in post. (laughs) And so you'll actually go through a huge effort not to change things. Your brain just works that way. And that's what your ego does. And that's why you'll put up with a woman who treats you like absolute garbage and make excuses for her. Even if she hits you, she cheats on you, all that stuff. The thing about getting angry is if you get angry enough, it's, it's the same effect that trauma has. It actually exposes your brain to the ability to become malleable again and take on additional information, change its mental firmware, change its mental models. So without that anger, you're essentially going to get guys who are live action role-playing or LARPing. And the best examples I've seen where guys get angry, because then when guys get angry, they do unreasonable things in order to get what they want. So you have to kind of bypass that. Because if you're predictable and if you're uh, like non-emotional about something you're just gonna nick away at the edges but to have true long-lasting change you kind of have to get a little pissed and so yeah that's the one thing you got to get and a lot of times and that's another thing here about the space that really bothers people is how how much it shits on women women are shit this women are trash that and you see it everywhere the problem is if you're the kind of guy who puts women on a pedestal and thinks they can do no wrong and you're always making excuses for, you know, your cheating whore of a wife, you kind of need to go a little far the other direction to get angry enough to be able to make that change. And that's where you can come out of it with a more nuanced and realistic opinion of yourself and of people around you. That, I mean, that's, I was just too kind of like listening to that thinking that makes perfect sense. You know, that, that I can see before how I didn't do that and how I am now and it was almost like I could see my ver- my old version of myself in that moment when you were saying that you know, it, it really kind of hit home that because I was definitely that way I, de- I, made, I made excuses yeah, and I bet you that one time you got this is when you actually started doing something though right I started the podcast and it completely changed my life and that's what I think is like I think that's what the scary thing is. There's so many guys looking just now thinking, well, what's my thing? I'm, I'm getting to that point. I'm getting pissed, but how, what, how do I start? How do I start moving stuff? And that's why I think your stuff is so vital. You know, it's, there's so many Charlton's out there, bullshitters. There's so many like fakers who just want the attention, who need the ego to trip themselves. Whereas you're actually changing people's lives, you know, and I, yeah, well, that's the thing. I don't really need. I don't need a friend at this point. Like, I got friends. At this point, we're here to sort the shit out. Because um, it's it's a take. I call it the take a penny, leave a penny jar. Somebody was there when I needed it, when nobody else would, and so I'm just passing that on to others. So, what would you say if for everybody listening just now, if you had to give them like say a main, a main challenge or three things you want them to do in the next one month to six months? What would it be? You know, if they came back to you, gave you a field report, what well, you know, what would you want them to have done after listening to this? Well, that's super general, but I'll try <laughs> to answer that one. Because it's mostly mostly like come back with what yeah. you want, obviously, but that's not really helpful for this. I would say come back with a consistent workout schedule and not this fuck around itis, like a proper workout. Come back knowing that you're the bad guy in somebody else's life story. 
And actually, I think I could just, yeah, and just what you want, I guess. Those three are kind of the best because at the end of the day, you really need resolve and you're going to get resolved through your discipline. You're going to get through resolve through not giving a fuck about other people. Now, I don't want to mean that to mean like, yeah, I want to kick a puppy, but just like you're not worried about how another person will react. And so if you're willing to be the bad guy in somebody else's story, then I think you're there. Because nobody, everybody wants to be the hero in their own story, but not at that cost. It's difficult, isn't it? Because when people say that question, I always find it's like some of it is so internal that it's hard to set a challenge, you know, unless you're doing the work yourself. Um, I mean, I've, yeah. I've actually loved chatting to you. I'd, I'm definitely going to have you on again because we haven't even touched the surface, but I'm, I'm, hes- I'm really kind of aware of your time. But what... Um, what would you want people to remember from this podcast? You know, what would you want the go home message to be? Would it be that they can do, you know, that there is more to life, that they can be themselves and attract people like on their level or, you know, what would you want them to remember? That's just it. I kind of don't want them to remember anything. Like, I don't mean that in a bad way either. It's just, if you listen to this and you get any kind of an emotional tingle or an emotional reaction thinking, yeah, that's awesome. That's just, feelings and that's not really going to do anything so to take it from this i don't want you to react at all i just want you to get angry and start doing something about it and then try to focus it on something that's actually productive for you as opposed to just being an antisocial retard <laughs> i actually love that uh, you know because everybody yeah. else has kind of gone with mantras or things to say and i love the fact that you've said you know stop fucking listening go and do and that yeah Oh, I agree. That's, that's oh, okay. I'll end off with this funny one. Every, uh, every time I've had this like one off clients and I always ask them like, so how did you find me? What have you read before this? Cause there's a lot of writers out there that write a lot on this space. And they always say the same thing. I watched you on your red morning podcast and I watched you and Rolo on red men group. I'm like, first things first, you got to stop watching the both of those. <laughs> those are entertainment. You don't need entertainment right now. <laughs> that's- and I always end up giving them like, a bunch, a bunch of books that they should start getting into. And then, getting on a startup workout program. Like first off, replace those three hours were taken from me every Saturday there and fill it with this. You're going to be far better off, which I feel really bad because my subscriber numbers are not going up, I think because of this. <laughs> and that's and that's the thing. It's like, you know, just get off your arse and go and do it. It took me years yeah. to do stuff. And like starting the podcast changed my life. Starting jujitsu has completely changed my life. Finding pick up, finding the likes of yourself, Mark Bell, Juju Mufu, you know, all these kind of amazing people that I've had on the podcast, like mm-hmm. Gary Vaughn, it has made me such a better person. And I can actually see people now who are in that same environment that I was. And I try to help lead them on, but they've got to do it themselves. They've got to find the, their reason for it. Otherwise, you can't do anything. You know, you can give them 50 challenges, but if you're not going to get off your arse and go out, what's the point? You know, get yeah, exactly. What's the point in getting a tingle when you could get? I was going to say a shingle, but that's not. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> that's maybe not what you want, but it's that. I think that should be the like the take message is like stop thinking, go out and do it. You know, go and become yep. the guy that you could be. Um, I'll screw it up. Don't worry, he'll be fine. <laughs> well, I've I've got to have you on again. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure making the connection. Yeah, you're, it'd be fun. I'd love to. You're an, you're an absolute star. I can see you going places. But how can people find you? How can people connect with you, social media? How can people work with you? You know, your website, follow up. Um, because we've barely we've barely tra- scratched the surface on some of the awesome content you have out there. You know, well, it's true, but thank you. I guess I'll put the easiest way, and I say the, the most important way is through my email newsletter. That's ryanstone.com slash newsletter. Because I'm always worried at any time you can kind of get Alex Jones from social media. That's the one place that no matter what happens, I'm always reachable there. And that'll be my email address as well as like all the stuff I talk about on Red Mornings, Red Man Group, or any of my videos. This is the stuff that's a little bit too edgy to put on social media. And this is stuff that's most helpful. Right now, I just started up again. I called it the fuck files where I go over all the things that I learned in pickup. And a lot of them are bad and a lot of them are good, but it's good lessons for other people. And then beyond that, there's Twitter and Instagram, which is underscore Ryan underscore stone for both of those handles. And then YouTube, it's just YouTube slash C slash Ryan stone. And those are the big ones to reach me at, as well as 
I guess the Red Man Group, which is its own channel. That's on every Saturday after Red Mornings, which is on at nine till ten. I got oh, and I almost forgot. There's also a Patreon. So for a lot of my Red Morning podcast stuff, that's still not suitable for advertisers. So I release that stuff primarily to the Patreon group there. So feel free to come in and support on that. And that's just patreon.com slash join underscore Ryan underscore stone. Cause that's what I mean. We haven't even started touching any of that kind of stuff yet. And there were so many questions I had on those kind of things, but you know, it, it's been an absolute pleasure. I cannot thank you enough for this. I mean, is there anything that you want to add? Is there any events coming up, any products that you've got coming out that you maybe want to highlight to people? Yeah, going to Poland in July for they're trying to do a 21 convention down there, which I think would be pretty cool. It'll be a good chance. I haven't had a chance to see Rolo and the guys yet. If you guys haven't got tickets, feel free to do so. If you're on my email list, I actually have a discount code for like 25%, which is only for like your private connection. So I save it for those guys. But uh, if and when you do go to this thing, it's obviously it costs a pretty penny. I get that. So it's not just about sitting down, watching speakers and then going home, like really start to engage because the most fun thing and it's not what the convention used to be for. But ever since Rolo brought a lot of the red pill guys on there, what we've done is we just hang out and guys will be coming in for lunch and they'll find, you know, Ed Lattimore, myself, AJ and Rolo sitting there having a beer and then they'll come in and join and just start shooting the shit. So yeah. Like, if you really want to get your most out of it, just start hanging around and talking to the speakers. We're all very approachable. We love hearing the stories. And it's always good to meet new guys because I'm actually surprised. A lot of the guys coming to this stuff are fairly well-to-do people that are higher up in whatever hierarchies. Like, there's some guys that work in big tech for the big companies there, like Apple and Google and that. There are some guys that uh, work in law enforcement, some guys in politics. Like, it's amazing the kind of people you meet that are that you wouldn't think would be approachable with this kind of message, but it's just kind of nice because then you have enough discretion and privacy that these people can talk openly, which you just can't do elsewhere. Plus if the New York times tries to sneak in for a hit piece, Jack Murphy, the one thing he's really good for is running them off. Cause he's like, what are they going to do to my reputation at this point? <laughs> so he always runs blocks and keeps all the crap off of you. Cause you realize it also probably helps guys realize that everybody's got the same shit deep down. You know, we don't, it doesn't matter how much money you've got in the bank it doesn't matter your car it's like you know fight club you're not your job no. you're not your khakis you're not your this you're not your that Every, you're just exactly. you. but it's been an awesome and I, I really I'm so delighted we made a connection I think you're definitely going places and I cannot wish you anything but success for the future you're definitely going to come back on and uh, I want to just keep an eye on you and see where you go because you're going to go places yeah I'd love that and next time I get a chance to get down to the UK there. I know I made the, I forgot accidentally that you're Scottish, not Irish, but if I ever get around Ireland, Scotland's only like a boat ride away anyway. So Definitely, I'm, maybe I'll, we'll try and do one of these live. I don't have to get you a few pints when you come over now. Maybe a battered haggis. I don't know if you've ever tried that. Haven't tried it, but I figure I can handle the organ meat. So I think I'll survive. Well, if you Google it, you might change your mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've heard. That's it for another week. Thanks for listening. Absorb it. Practice it. Use it. Until next time, keep trying to hit that next level in your life.